Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to episode 125 of the Live Your Fuckiest Life podcast. Today, I am joined with an amazing guest that I just finished reading her book, like, I want to say at the end of last week, um, when I figured out that I was for sure getting you on the pod, I was like, cool, done reading, reading this book in the next 24 hours. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so excited to have you because I discovered you on TikTok um, and immediately was like, okay, these, this is my kind of human. And just the way that you speak, the way that you so vulnerably and transparently show up on the online space, I was like immediately sunk, hook sunk, all of that good stuff into your world. Um, and reading your book, I only became a deeper fan and a deeper champion for your message and also just you as a human. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about all things heartbreak and recovery and all of that process because I feel like I haven't really done that on the podcast before. So before we officially dive in, um, let's, let's, let's figure out who Gabrielle Stone is. So Gabrielle Stone is no stranger to the world of entertainment. Growing up on set with her legendary scream queen mother, Dee Wallace, who was in E.T., right? She, was she the mom in E.T.? Yeah, yeah, she was. <laughs> um, she had days of looking off mommy's fake blood and watching behind the scenes movie magic. Seeing the world with mom and dad gave her the travel bug at an early age until Gabrielle experienced a real life horror when she lost her father suddenly at age seven. After many years in the industry herself, Stone transitioned from meaty acting roles to writing and directing. Her award-winning films, It Happened Again Last Night and After Emma, gained her awards for writing, directing, and acting, but she had a bigger role in life that would soon present itself. Freaking badass. After the rug was vigorously pulled out from her, from under her when her husband's affair came to light, she found herself falling into the arms of another man. After a second failed attempt at love and a massive heartbreak, she decided that instead of landing flat on her ass, she'd make a career out of it. And so came the birth of the book, Eat, Pray, Hashtag FML, where she shared all the mistakes, all the lessons, and most importantly, how she became a fearless leader from it all. Welcome to the fucking podcast. <laughs> Thank you. What a fucking intro. Um, and I'm, I, it means so much to me to hear when people find me online that what I'm putting out there does come off as authentic because I work really hard to like not have that bullshit layer that social media so puts out there now that everything's fucking perfect because I mean, hello, look at my life. I, I'm sure it's all not. <laughs> like anybody is. And I think when you see people presenting themselves that way online, I know for the longest time I used to compare myself to people like that and be like, why is my life not like that? And I think that's a huge downfall with it, with Instagram and social media in general. But I think also it's kind of like, okay, what's actually going on behind the scenes? Like, are you really in that great of a place? Because that can't be possible. It just not, it doesn't feel human. It's not I, real. I struggle to connect with that completely. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was in my marriage, actually, I remember when the the news of the divorce first broke, I had even, you know, pretty decent, I would say decent friends of mine, not my super close friends, but friends of mine that were reaching out going, oh my God, I thought everything was totally fine. Like we were looking at pictures of you on your honeymoon wishing we were you. Mm -hmm. um, and that really stuck with me. So when I went on this Eat, Pray, FML journey, I was like, okay, I'm going to show up like exactly how I am every day. And if that's fucking sad and shitty, then that's what everybody's going to get. <laughs> I so resonate with that. It's so interesting too. I feel like our journeys, while different from a relationship standpoint, have been really like similar. We're like, I both, I also am an actor and come from an acting background and then wrote a book about something oh, nice. opposite from acting. So when I first found that out about you, I was like, oh fuck, like we have so much in common, super similar stuff. And I just feel like it's really rare to have someone, one, be so comfortable swearing and put that in their book. And like, <laughs> I chopped off my tits and my podcast is called Live Your Fuck Yes Life. So clearly- I love it. Like, I'm with you on that. But, my kind of girl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, she's going to be my kind of human. But also, I just think it's really, really rare to see somebody in both spaces, like in the acting and performing world and super successful at that, no less. And also in the entrepreneur world and kind of taking that by storm. So- my question is like, I really struggled when I first started on doing the entrepreneur world. I felt like I was living almost two separate lives where like mm -hmm. they didn't converge and they didn't connect. And I never expected to get into, you know, business or writing a book or any of that. It kind of just happened. So my question is like, 
have you been able to merge those worlds? Have they separated for you? Like what, what was the transition period for that? Cause it's such a wild shift. Yeah, that is an interesting question. And I think I had an interesting experience with it because my kind of merge, if you will, happened during the pandemic. So I released the book in June of 2019. Um, and I think I did like one other project once it released as an actress. And then I went on a second solo trip to Asia, came back, and then the pandemic kind of started. So all of the acting and directing stuff kind of went away. And I luckily had the book that was, you know, a revenue that was coming in from online. And then the TikTok videos started going viral. So I for the last year and a half have been way more of an author and podcast host and, you know, presence, if you will, yeah. than, than an actor and a director. So it's almost like it, it, it kind of took a back seat. It like it was going to anyways for me, but it did it mm -hmm. effortlessly because the acting and directing was literally taken away during the pandemic. So I've still, you know, I, d I shot two projects in 2020, one that I directed, one that I was in front of camera. Um, and I don't think I'll ever stop doing that. Yeah. But the fulfillment in that I've gotten in my life right now is coming from the book tenfold and connecting with all the people that are reading it. That's and really they're cool the to dogs yeah, come into play. That's really <laughs> cool to hear. Like, what about the the connection piece has been? Because I get that. Like, there's some, there's there is nothing. Like, it brings me to tears every time when somebody reaches out and says, "Hey, like, reading your book changed my life, or hearing your story changed my life, or whatever." Like, there's something different about that versus. I saw your, your show or, you know, I watched you in this film and it was incredible and it like changed my, changed the game. It's a different level of fulfillment that I didn't expect to receive or even know what that feeling felt like. What is mm -hmm. that, what is that connection piece like been like for you? It's been really invaluable. Um, and you're so right. You know, I've, I've directed pieces. The, the first film that I directed and I was playing the lead in as well is all about domestic violence, LGBTQ plus, like it's, um, so I've had those people come up to me and say, Oh my God, this film resonated with me so deeply. And, but you're right. It's a different level when it's about your own life. And when I wrote this book, I mean, it happened to me. I didn't just sit down and be like, it's time to write a book now, you know, like yeah. it was because of the shit that was exploding in my life. Yeah. And it, it really, you know, when I did the first draft of it, my mom read it and she was like, Oh God, Gabrielle, are you sure you don't want to like change your name or take out one of the people you sleep with? Like, it's just a lot. And I was like, no, you know, if I'm going to put it out there, I'm going to do it raw and authentically. And that's the reason why a lot of the big publishers put, pushed back. So I ended up self-publishing because I knew I wanted it to be authentic and brutally honest. And yeah. that's what people are connecting with. Yeah, I get that. I also went the self-publishing route for that reason. Cause I was like, I'm not being mm, stifled or yeah. limited in the way that I want to present a really challenging time of my life, you know? Totally. And like, totally. You talk so much. Okay, before we even get into like the the heart of the book, I know I kind of shared a little bit about it in the intro, but for people who have maybe never heard your book, can you just give like a snapshot of yes, what what, the, what it's about? I know you're in the process of writing your second one too, right? I am. Um, yeah, I just actually like yesterday sent it the first official draft to my editor, so I'm like trying not to panic. Um, so yes, um, Eat Pray FML uh, is about the shit show of my life in 2017. I was married for almost two years found out my husband was having an affair with a 19 year old for six months, filed for divorce, left. Shortly after that, I met a guy. We fell madly in love with each other, had a whirlwind romance. Um, and he convinced me to go on a month long trip to Italy with him. 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, he told me he needed to go by himself. And I was absolutely devastated. Like he broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a decision to make, and that was either stay at home heartbroken or go travel Europe for a month by myself. So I took a backpack and I did six countries over the span of a month and wrote a book about it. <laughs> and it's really fucking epic. You Thanks, know, girl. when I first saw the title, I was like, because I, when I, when Eat, Pray, Love came out, I was like, fuck yeah, this book is my book. Like, I'm going to have a story like this one day yeah. where I find myself and all this shit. And I've never done it. Like, I've never gone and traveled by myself. I'm such an extrovert and I just feel 
I feel like the idea of going on a month long trip by myself scares the fucking shit out of me. Like yeah, I don't that's know. why you have to do it, girl. It will change your life. And, and reading your book, I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> like I'm, I'm convinced <laughs> now, but it's funny. Cause I remember reading a pray love and being like, this is the kind of thing I need to do for myself. I wonder, like, did you have that moment where you're like, I can't do this? Oh, before? totally. Like every step of the way. So when I found out he wanted to go on the trip by himself, I was like, well, my bag was literally already packed. Um, my tickets were all confirmed and I didn't really have time to, to come up with a plan B. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, I mean, when he, when we first met and talked about it, um, when I knew that I was going to be going by myself and I told him I was going to still go, when he dropped me off after that conversation, he looked at me and he's like, how are you feeling, Gabs? And I said, like, I'm about to go on a journey of eat, pray, fuck my life. <laughs> and that's the title of the book. Um, and that night I watched Eat, Pray, Love for the first time. I had never seen it. I had never read the book. I obviously knew about it, yeah. um, but I had never watched it. And I remember sitting there watching the first scene going, holy shit, this is my fucking life. Mm. Like what is happening right now? Um, and it, yeah, I mean, I knew that whatever the trip was going to bring was going to be really massive because, I mean, at this point, my friends were calling me every day going, okay, we just wanted to know what's going on in the Netflix episode that's become your life because it was ridiculous. <laughs> like every, it was happening one right after another. It was like, boom, she finds out her husband's having an affair. Yeah. Boom, she files for divorce. Boom, she falls in love. Boom, they're going on a trip. Boom, just kidding. No, they're not. Like It was ridiculous. I mean, it's a lifetime um, story, like movie ready to be. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I knew that whatever was going to happen on the trip was going to be really life-changing for me. And I've never written a book before. I'm, I don't, con I didn't consider myself a writer. Um, and I bought a leather bound journal and I started it the day I landed in London and wrote three fourths of it by hand in the journal. And it's not like I was journaling. It's That's wild. open it. And it says like chapter one. <laughs> so. I think that's so crazy though, that you wrote it by hand. Like, yeah. So, because you obviously didn't plan to write a book right? Like, was it, or was it intentional? Were, did, were you like, I'm going to start writing and just see what happens? I made the decision the day, the day before I left for Europe, I was like, I'm going to write a book. So I bought that journal knowing that I was writing a book. And when you open it in the beginning, it's like chapter one and it's very close to how the finished book ended up. Wow. Okay. So it was like a fully intentional process. The yeah. Whole way through. And yep. so the way that you read it is very much, it feels very chronological. It feels very much like you're almost writing it on a day-to-day -day basis as you would like to recap your journal. Yeah. Like, that's very much how it reads. Was that also how it happened as you were writing? Yeah. So I was writing as things were happening on the trip. Um, and the last chapters I wrote were actually, I was never going to include the details about the affair and the divorce. I was just going to kind of use that as like a so this is what happened and set the stage because it's not really what the story's about. And then all my girlfriends were like, no, 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 Gabrielle. That shit was like an episode of CSI. You have to detail like how you found out. Um, so I wrote those once I came home and then I wrote the chapters about Javier, who's the man that broke up with me before Europe, uh, how he and I fell in love. And that was really brutal to go back and write after I had gone on this crazy journey and like everything was now at a standstill, um, to go back and like see that I didn't misstep and that there was no part where I like was pushing and it was all like on his end, you know? Yeah. Um, it was really tough. Um, but the rest of it, I, I wrote on the trip in order as it was happening, which is why I think a lot of people when they read it feel like they're traveling through Europe with me. Completely. I felt that way completely. I think that's so interesting. And I always love asking authors that because I think everyone's process of writing is so different. And yeah. I remember like I started writing my book without realize I was write, realizing I was writing my book. I was like blogging at the time and, you know, journaled a lot. And I was on a trip with my mom and it was like two, two months post my, my double mastectomy. And I was like, okay, like I need to write about this. It's been a year of my life and like, I just need to get this out. And yeah, <laughs> like a day and I wrote like 7,000 words and I was like, I think I'm writing a book, mom. And she was like, oh, I oh, love I it. Think you are too. Um, and it just flowed, like it just flowed and it just happened. And I, it was not planned. It was not at all expected. And then there are some people who are like, it was such a trudging process and like all this stuff. And so I just always find it so fascinating to hear different That's people's amazing. experiences. And I, I love that you went back afterwards. Cause, and I'm glad you included that shit about your 
you know, ex-husband and the, and the whole affair. Cause let me tell you, like I was reading that and I was like, is this possible? Like, how is this real? Like, how does a person create such a world where they think that that's at all a possibility for yeah. uh, like, it, it truly blew my brain. Yeah. And it's cr- what's even crazier is the amount of messages I get daily about like this exact situation happened to me or your story mirrors mine. It's Ugh. unbelievable. And men and women, you know, like I get messages from men and they're like, I had a Javier in my life or I had a Daniel in my life. And it's wild how many people go through it. It's, it's really sad. That makes me really sad to hear because I mean, I re- I read it and it felt so out there. Like it felt yeah. so, and it is, I mean, it's, it's, it is out there. Like it doesn't feel real. You're reading it and you're like, this cannot possibly be accurate. This cannot possibly be true that like all of these details are, they just feel so like, how, 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 like how question mark, how is this yeah. possible? And the fact that you're telling me that not only is it possible, but that a million other people are reaching out to you and saying the same thing, like that breaks my heart. Yeah. It's really crazy how shitty humans can be. Um, I will never understand why they think it's okay to lie and cheat as opposed to just breaking up and ending the relationship. Um, And it must be, I remember looking at my ex-husband and being like, God, you must be exhausted. Like second phone, second life. Like you must be absolutely exhausted, dude. I mean, I'm one of those people that cannot lie for the life of me. Like, Mm -hmm. Like, I just can't. I can't. It's the worst. I've, I, you know, even a small, tiny lie. Like, I'm like, ah, you know, like, you know that I'm not telling the truth. So yeah. yeah, I can't imagine having like this double life and attempting to, you know, masquerade around with a, with a human I'm spending my life with. Like, that's so right. mind boggling to me. I, I wanted to ask you this because I think when I first got into the book, I knew a little bit about what it was about given your TikToks and stuff. Yeah. And I assumed very incorrectly b- based on reading the book, but I assumed that your heartbreak heading into this big trip was going to be rooted primarily in your marriage mm-hmm. and in, you know, the dissolvement of it and reading it. And I don't want to assume, so I'm going to ask straight out, but reading yeah. it, it felt very clear to me from the way in which you spoke about these men and and experienced through the, through these pages, like your experiences of it, it seemed to me like you felt this massive heartbreak and like a way more of a deeper wound from Javier yeah. than your ex-husband. Is that true? It's completely true. And I so many times would get, oh, he was just your rebound. And I was like, oh God, I wish, mm-hmm. like how I wish he was just my rebound. Um, You know, it came obviously, you know, as you read, it came in my relationship with Javier as I was trying to help him through some of his grief came my realization that, you know, I had married my, my ex-husband because it was safe. I had loved my high school sweetheart and he died. I had loved my dad and he died. So I married someone that I wasn't fully in love with because it was safe. Obviously that was deep subconscious shit going on. I didn't know this until later. (laughs) Right. That wasn't something I walked down the aisle knowing. Um, And it, because of that, and because I had been unhappy in my marriage for, you know, six months when all of this finally came to light it was really easy for me to walk away. I wasn't in love with him. I I felt like he was giving me an out um, to really like have a second chance at my life because I would have stayed in that marriage for so long trying to make it work with the pressure of like, we just had this big wedding and like we took these vows and you know, we had been in therapy for six months. Like I would have stayed a lot longer than I should have if he didn't give me a, such a clear reason to walk away. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I met Javier. I mean, it's interesting. I, there's like, you know, obviously with art, it's subjective. So there's a good 5% of people that read this book that fucking hate it. Like, and the, they really hate it. Like you either are obsessed with it and it becomes your Bible or you're like, I hate this bitch. I never want to like, pick I mean, up that's a book good though. polarity means you're doing something right. Yeah. You know, and of course it's like something that's very, you know, racy, I guess, or like it's, you know, people judge and that's fine. And I I expected that. Um, 
But some of the comments that I've seen would be like, oh my God, she just won't get over this guy and let go of this guy. I was like, oh, you've never been in that type of like toxic love heartbreak. Yeah. Just, I get it. Um, and it's like, if you think that book one, you know, had a lot of messy stuff with Javier, just wait till book two. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, but you know, it, it was my, my journey and my, my truth. And I think that he represents so much more than just a man and a heartbreak. Um, he is really the reason why I am now a best-selling author and I'm sitting here talking to you about that book because he broke me in a way that I could open up exponentially and heal myself. And I will forever be grateful to him for that. Mm. I like want to like snapshot that (laughs) me so that I could open. Yeah. I think that that's something that not enough people really sit with when heartbreak has, you know, comes to pass. Like I, I have not had a Javier experience in my life or something as massive from a relational standpoint in this way, but I've been, I mean, I, I'm Polly. And so like the last three years, like I've had a lot of relationships and Mm -hmm. heartbreak is a fucking beast. And when I first, you know, cause I'd been, I've been with my husband for 10 years, like met him when I was 19, like was like, okay, I'm not going to experience heartbreak other than maybe friendships. Like I'm not going to heartbreak anymore. And that's, you know, I opened myself up to a space where that, and now I, I have the opportunity for that. And when I first started navigating it, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself, like, why am I doing this to myself? Like, it's so hard. And what's, what is the, the silver lining? And I'm like such right. a you know, positive person. I always see like the, the positive of a situation. And I really struggled my first couple heartbreaks to see that. And a partner of mine, or, uh, yeah, she's no longer a partner of mine, but she, she made a comment to me when we were together that has really stuck with me. And it's that relationships are our biggest teachers. Mm-hmm. And your comment just now made me reflect on that statement yeah. in a big way. And I'm curious, like, do you also feel that way? Because if there's anything that this book is about, to me, it's about relationships and how they shift and like move even in a small way, like these people that you were meeting in these different places, yeah. like they impacted you in small ways. They helped you see something in a new light or I like regain, help you re- regain confidence in yourself in a way. And it was so beautiful in these small instances to witness like the shift in you and, and in the way even you spoke as mm-hmm. the book progressed. And I'm just curious, like, how did your trip and the people you met along the way like impact your perspective on relationships? Um, I think you're spot on um, that relationships are definitely our biggest teachers and that includes the relationship with yourself. Um, so each person that I met on my Europe trip kind of showed me different parts of myself. So not only was I learning from a relationship with the people that I was meeting, I was also learning different things about myself and how to love myself and be in a relationship with myself. Um, and I, I think I, I say a lot um, in you know my podcasts and when I do videos and stuff that one of the hardest things to do as a human is to grieve a person that is still alive. Um, and I, I can confidently say that because I've lost enough people in my life to be able to compare and contrast. Um, and it's, so yeah, I think the book, you know, why it resonates with men and women is because heartbreak and grief is universal. We all deal with that at some point in our lives as humans. And It's about what we can learn from those experiences and how we can grow from them um, and not staying in the victimhood of them. um, That is what makes us really beautiful creatures, I think. Mm, I love that. What do you feel like was your biggest lesson or the thing that you learned most about yourself post your heartbreak with Javier? Um, So I normally... I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. Normally you can't see it sometimes until you're like a little farther away from it and you're looking back. But in that way, 
<laughs> but in that moment when he told me that he had to go by himself and I decided that I was going to go, I knew exactly why it was happening. I could clearly see it. Since I lost my dad when I was a little girl, I've had a massive fear of abandonment. And that fear of abandonment throughout my life manifested in I never wanted to be alone or I always had a roommate and I you know, always had friends over. I was never truly by myself. Mm. And it was holding me back. That fear of abandonment was holding me back from a lot of incredible things in my life. Um, and when the universe kind of put this in my lap, it was like, oh, okay, Gabrielle, well, we're going to go face that shit head on and you're going to do it across the world by yourself. And we're only going to give you two days so that you can't fucking chicken back out. So I knew that it was happening for a reason. And it it sent me on this big journey of self-love and how to fix that fear of abandonment within myself. So I think as a takeaway from that trip, the biggest thing I learned was that I'm never truly abandoned because I will never abandon myself. And when that got like clicked in my brain, it was like, oh, okay, I can actually let all that shit go. I mean, it's still a thing you have to, it's a trigger that you have to continuously look at when it comes up. But to have that rooted now in inside my brain and my heart was life-changing for me. Oh, I love that. Oh, I got like shivers and <laughs> hearing you say that. I just think, I, yeah, I think that's an incredible answer and what a gift, you know, you know, it's something that is so heartbreaking and seemingly like I, I, I resonated with that particular part of the book and that heartbreak because I, I feel like I had a person in my life who I thought would be a forever person in my life. It wasn't a romantic partner, but somebody who I felt like was a soulmate of mine for sure. And, you know, completely, you know, threw me out basically. And I've, I've never felt more heartbroken, I think in my whole life than by that human. And, you know, it's like a, over a year later and I'm, I'm now realizing all of the lessons from that experience, you know, and yeah. all of the things that, you know, I wouldn't be if it weren't for that, um, that loss. And yeah. it can feel, you know, what you said is like, there's, there's this next level version of grief for somebody who's still around. Like I, I hear that and that hits home in a way that I'm sure so many people listening also feel because it can be really hard to lose someone and then know that they're still living their life, but they're choosing to live it without you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a different kind of staying. And for me personally, I had never, had my heart broken in that way. I had always been the one breaking up with people. I'd gone through some shitty breakups that I was sad about, but I never had experienced something like that. And it actually wasn't until recently, um, maybe five or six months ago, and we, we did a podcast episode on it um, on FML Talk, uh, where I found out what love bombing was. Yeah. And oh I was I'm like, oh. about this with my friends. Yeah, I was like, oh my God, this is literally what, I went through and it's so intense and it's it's almost in in a way more gnarly than if a two or three year relationship ends because you feel like it's run its course or you know you've gotten what you needed out of it or you can like see where missteps went but with love bombing for those listening that don't know what it is um it's basically you meet someone and they shower you with love and affection um, to the point where it's just like super hot and heavy, zero to 100, exactly how Javier and I were. Um, I mean, we, over the span of five days, it was like, uh, you're my person. I'm having kids with this person. Let's go to Europe and like yeah. sign sealed delivered. Yeah. Um, and it's because they're one of the, the person that's doing the love bombing has a void inside themselves and they're trying to fill that and they think that you're going to be able to do that. So they like get intoxicated with you and shower you with all this stuff because it feels at first like they're like you're filling them up. But obviously everybody knows you can't be filled up by another person. You have to do that for yourself. So when they realize that it's not working anymore and they're not getting that high anymore, they cut everything off. Yeah. So it's literally like cutting things off in the, like the beginning, middle of a honeymoon stage. That's and rough. it's- it's unbelievable. Well, it's good though that you have that awareness now because I know when I did, when learned about this term like a few weeks ago, I was like, uh, this explains so much. Yeah. And it's like, why are people not talking about this? Like, this makes so much sense. We're not fucking crazy. You yeah. weren't like overly in love, you know, and like being overdramatic about it. 
And now it's like a red flag you can look for, you know? Yeah. And I've noticed that. Like I, I'm, you know, talking to a bunch of people right now and one of them is like very love bomby. And at first it was like, you know, affectionate and like, I want to do all these things with you. And very quickly it moved to anytime I would say like, oh, I like doing this or here's my, one of my favorite places in the world. It, every time it was like, we should do that together or mm. let's go there together. And like all these like future plans. And I'm like, we've been talking for two weeks. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh uh, yeah. The future plans, man. I mean, yeah. we were, we were five days in and we had like, we're going to his friend's wedding. We're going to my work event in Vegas. We're obviously going to Europe for a month. We're meeting yeah. his parents on this day. We're meeting my parents on this. I mean, it was insane. And now looking back on it, I'm like, mm. yeah, that wasn't so healthy. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, good red flags to look out for. for yeah, sure. for sure. <laughs> I'm curious because I know I experienced this. Like you experienced all of this in 2017. You wrote the book, you had the experience for yourself. Like, and that was, I mean, what, three years ago now, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's a decent amount of time. Do you find it bizarre to like be in 2021 and in a way because of your book, like you're reliving it while everyone else is experiencing that? Like, is that a weird sensation for you? Is it hard? Like, um, I, it is. And it's, it, well, there's two answers to that. There's part of me that it's just become my job. Like, you know, I talk about my exes every day, um, whether it's on social media or on a podcast or, you know, talking to readers that are, are listening. And I'm obviously, I'm in a really healthy, happy relationship now. So that's been interesting to navigate and he's a godsend, God bless him. But, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's weird for sure. Um, I think when I had a conversation with Javier, when he read the book for the first time, he was like, I don't even know if I've talked about this publicly. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah. Um, he, he basically was like, I had to put it down many times and it took me a long time to read because it was so hard to relive every step of that, like the love and then the downfall of it and then seeing my experience, you know, cause it's not often that you break someone's heart and then have to read 280 pages about how the fuck they feel about it. Um, so he was like, it took me a really long time because it, it was like reliving all of it. And I said, yeah, dude, imagine what it was like every time I had to edit and go back and read and, you know, and it's the same thing with the second book. Like it, it, you're really reliving stuff. Then the second one for me has been even harder to write because it's been over two years. So I'm going back and dredging up things that are healed and things that, you know, now I'm in a different place and I look back at conversations and have a different perspective on it. And I'm like, oh my God, fuck this person. Like this was not okay. You know, and it's, it's been a challenge for sure. Um, but I think on the day to day scale, it's, um, what outweighs the weirdness of talking about my exes is seeing the healing and the fulfillment that readers are getting from it. So it, when I talk to readers that DM me and stuff, it's really just, I feel like I'm talking about characters in my story. Um, Cause that's especially my ex-husband, um, you know, Javier's is starting to transfer into that as well. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, you feel like you're, talking about characters and it becomes less of a interesting uh, trigger inside. That's so interesting because I mean, you're speaking about your life. So it's yeah. super interesting that you're able to, you know, now that you've spoken about it so much that you're able to compartmentalize about it. I don't think I've been able to get there largely because, you know, the way that I wrote my book was a lot m less like a story in the, in a sense, like it wasn't, there weren't a lot of characters outside of my own stuff. Yeah. And, so it's really hard to separate, you know? Um, and also, you know, it was a, tra a trauma of a different nature. Yeah. But there's something about, you know, and as actors, like we get, like when you put yourself in an as if circumstance, right. And you're stepping into a role or, or a past version of yourself, like you remember what those sensations feel like, like depending on how method you get, like you can feel it in your body, you can experience that shit. And I was curious how that, how that went for you, because I, I think reliving those heartbreaks, those massive heartbreaks, and frankly, like 
the the trauma of that, you know, because I read it and I was like, this is trauma. Like this, you you experienced trauma, and and also was like a healing of your past traumas, which was really beautiful. Yeah, big time. But that's a lot. It's expansive and it, it it's open hearted, but it's also like a lot to experience as a reader. So I imagine as like having lived that, it was like a wild ride. And so I just think the the prospect of reliving that would be really scary to me all the time. But also, you know crash into your fears because that's it. I mean, it, it is, but I think that's one of the reasons why I've been able to heal in such a unique way. I mean, obviously I, I have been in and out of therapy my entire life. I am a big advocate of it. I think you should go and talk about shit even when nothing is wrong in your life. Um, but my healing really came from writing this book and then retelling the story and reliving it and being able to see other people heal from it. Um, partly because it made it feel like it was all worth it to go through it and I would do it again. Mm -hmm. Um, but also because the more you talk about your feelings and, you know, what something could mean and, you know, what's underneath the shit that's at the surface, the more you're going to get to and the more you're going to heal. So it's the same as talking about it in interviews, you know, and I get asked different questions and I have to like think about different perspectives and it's really been another journey of healing for me. Yeah. I always say like, if you want to really, really heal from something traumatic, write a book about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, people are like, how did you get through 2017? I'm like, I wrote a fucking book about it. Like Truly that's so. how I got through it. <laughs> I completely resonate with that. That is amazing. So, okay. What's your next book about then? Is it like a continuation kind of of the story? And yeah. Like so it, it starts the moment I step off the plane from Europe. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah. And it goes all the way up until December of 2017 or sorry of 2019. So it's two years time span. Um, the first one was obviously like three months total, which is insane. When you look back on it, you're like, wait, you <laughs> found you out. Your much was cheating. Cheating. <laughs> yeah. You found out he was cheating. You got divorced. You fell in love. You got broken up with and you went on a month long trip and it was only three months. Yeah. Welcome to my life. Um, <laughs> um, but the second one spans over two years. Um, and it's, it's a journey in a different way. Um, I can't say that there's as many like life bombs that happen, like the divorce and yeah. like the, you know, Massive finding friend. out you're going on the trip, um, two days before, but it's, <laughs> it's the continuation, um, of what happened in my life and how I ended up healed and here. Um, mm. All of, al almost all, if not all of the men make some type of an appearance. So I get asked every day, do you still talk to Javier? Did Chris ever come to LA? Um, so yeah. all of those answers get, get answered Answer. in the book. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been a wild ride to, um, to write because one of the the main characters that people will meet in book two is my my boyfriend. I was gonna ask um, about that because you said yeah. So it's it's been really difficult because he and I have had a very intense two year journey, um, and it's hard to go back and write about stuff that I'm not necessarily proud of, stuff that I know is going to hurt him, stuff that hurt, it hurts me to write. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we went into it. He he knew what he was getting into when he when he started dating me, but um, it really it's a constant journey to be like, okay, we both know what happened. We both have like been brutally honest and talked about it anytime we like separated and came back together. But it's different to go back and read about it in detail with with people that are real life people in your life. You know, they're not just characters. So it's it's been an interesting journey to try and stay balanced through all of it for sure. <laughs> read what you've already written, like your first draft. No, I told him, I was like, you're not going to read it until I have a, a draft with my editor that I know is going to be closer to the final. Cause I sent her literally like 150,000 words. I was like, hi, this is two books. So what are we going to do? Oh, yeah. um, I so that. once I have it cut down and I know what I'm taking out and we're kind of going back to do like a more grammatical line edit, I'll let him read that version. Yeah. Yeah. That must be two parts like exciting, but also scary. Like I, I, I'm also experiencing this cause I'm really thinking about like writing my second book. And while my husband was in my first book, like my second book is probably going to be about like coming into my queerness late in life and polyamory and yeah, um, the mistakes 
that were made along the way. And, you know, like he's a really private person. And while he's like become a lot more in the last five years, like cool with things being shared or like he recently like did my podcast with me for like five, we did like a episode on or a series around polyamory and he like nice. his perspective, which was really amazing and super, super um, thoughtful. But like, you know, the idea of then writing a whole book around that experience and, and getting it into a little more of the nitty gritties is a little scary for yeah. me, let alone for I'm sure him. So like, is your, is your current partner like more of a private person normally? Like has No, um, he's an actor, so he's used to kind of like being out there, but yeah. I mean, I, he definitely, it's, it's more out there than he's been in the past for sure. Um, and there's, there's details that like we've talked about, you know, he has a daughter and I do Mm -hmm. write about certain things in that. So I'm very conscious as I was in the first book, when I was writing about Javier and his brother and his family, I'm very conscious of what I'm putting out. Um, and still writing it authentically from, from a place of truth. Yeah. But yeah, it's never fun to, um, to know you have to have those conversations where you're like, Hey, I need you to sign something because I wrote another book. Um, So I'm not looking forward to those particular conversations. Um, But, you know, here we are. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I can't, I mean, I can't imagine like having that many people to, to navigate that around, you know, I guess like so far, yeah, I haven't really had to navigate that as an author. So well, the the trick is you only have to get a signed permission thing if you include text messages or like right. email from it's the people. Evident. And obviously like my book has has a few people that has those. So anyone that has text messages in Eat, Pray, FML signed a release form. We had like a full on conversation about it. Um, and, you know, obviously Javier and his his mother and his sister, they are all in that category. And we're all so supportive of me. Mm you know, putting my journey out there. And I know that he knows how many people this book has helped. Um, and a lot of those people, you know, that message me, there's a, a handful of them that heal because they saw how he dealt with his grief. Um, so there's so many different sides of the characters in this book that are bringing different things to different people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm really thankful that everyone has supported me and I hope They'll continue to do that with I'm the second sure one. They will. I what I because you've you've made like shifts in names and stuff so that people. Oh, for sure. Name. Yeah. No, everybody's like, name is is changed in the book. Um, Daniel is uh, who's my ex husband's name in the book is actually the name that he booked all of his second hotels under and had his yeah. second phone listed under. So it's Sneaky. there's some cheeky changes, uh-huh. um, and then some are just you know changed for privacy and stuff. Has anyone had their like privacy? discovered in the process? Um, my readers are insane in the best way. Um, and yes, I get DMs often asking like, is this who this is? Actually recently, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm friends with one of Javier's good friends and someone DM'd him, the friend, and said, are you Javier? <laughs> and he was like, oh my God, you guys are insane. Um, so yeah, there's been people that have figured it out. Um, I just never publicly confirm or deny it because it's, you know, it, it's not important at the end of the day. Yeah. I know people like care because they're invested and I, I think that's awesome. But at the end of the day, it's not about the men in the book. It's about yeah. my journey and like what, what came from the men in the book. Mm, I love that. Yeah. And it is, I mean, I read your book as like a journey to self-love really a journey on honestly, like a journey to liberation at the end of the day. Like that's what, that's what it read to me. And I, I think that anyone who is, has experienced any kind of trauma, heartbreak or pain in their life, like at the end of the day, we just want to be, feel free. We just want to feel like the most ourselves. And I think your book is a beautiful representation of that and something that I encourage all of you to pick up. It's a super, super fun read. Like it's perfect, especially now that the weather's shifting, just like go to the park, take it with you, put up your hammock and just don't leave until it's done. Cause you'll (laughs) you'll probably just like go right through it. I know I did. So thanks girl. I'm so happy to hear that. I really love it. And I I think it's great that you're continuing. So do you see yourself like just writing books, like moving forward? Is that kind of yeah, it's so weird because obviously, you know, the first one was about 
my life exploding. And the second one is a continuation of that. So after that's done, I mean, unless, you know, shit hits the fan and like my life gets turned upside down again. Um, I don't know. Cause I, I love writing about what I know. I love writing the what's real. Um, I don't know if I would ever want to do fiction. Um, cause especially now, like my fan base is like about the raw realness. So I don't know. Um, we obviously have the podcast that, that stemmed off of the book. So I, I do that now. And that's been an amazing extension to continue to connect with my readers and new people, which has been amazing. Um, and to get to really go into detail and depth on new topics that I want to talk about. Um, it's, you know, we cover everything that's like relationship, divorce, heartbreak, cheating, but then we also, you know, talk about grief. We talk about love bombing. We, you know, do all kinds of stuff, which has been really great for me to continue using my voice in that way. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what, what will happen after the second book. I guess it kind of depends on like where my life takes me. I'm still definitely like not done directing. want to get back behind the camera and in front at some point. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. And that's cool. I think that's beautiful. Like, welcome to the world of the unknown where we just- Right, wherever the wind blows you. Exactly. And that's, I think it's the best. Personally, that's the way that I like to live. So I identify with that deeply. I also think it's, I think it's awesome. Like, I think everyone listening to this right now, like my Live Your Fuck Yes lifers are probably very, very in line with your FMLers or whatever. Yes, I love that. (laughs) Um, I feel like our audiences are probably like really- aligned. So yes. um, I'm excited that you're on here. I feel like everyone needs to go, you know, follow you, follow you on TikTok, follow you on Instagram, you know, make sure to subscribe to her podcast, all that good stuff. Cause if you like it here, you'll like it there is my guess. So. Oh, I love that. I, 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 the second you reached out to me and I saw the name, I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. Like I, it's for like over three years on the podcast now. And I just, I, it makes me laugh that like when I first started my, like the name, and like the brand. I was like, yeah, this feels like me and we'll see how it evolves. And I just yeah. love that everything that I've done moving forward has just so like effortlessly fit under the umbrella of live your fuck yes life. Because to me, like that's what, that's what life is all about is like, is living and embodying your fuck yes life and self. And um, oh yeah, girl, that in such a beautiful way. So three years, that's amazing. Good for you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a wild ride and we've, we've talked about so many different things on the podcast now. I feel like I can't even keep track. Like, I, I love it. That's amazing. Wild. Yeah. I'm glad you're, like, you're doing it and getting into it too. Cause it's such a fun platform. It's so different than writing a book and it's totally it's just cool yeah, to be able to have really awesome rad people and, you know, get them to share their stories and like talk and talk openly and just see what comes up, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. All right, Especially now see- when everything's like virtual and shit, we like need that connection. connection. Truly, yeah. honestly, I feel like podcasting has been like the one way that I've been able yeah. to stay sane. I'm like, thank you for being here with me. You are my one person. I'm <laughs> my husband today, so cool. I love it. <laughs> okay, you want to do some fast fun questions before we hop off? Oh my God, I'm terrible at these, but yes, I'll do my best. Okay, they're not <laughs> that bad. Okay, biggest lesson that this pandemic has taught you? Oh my God, um, that it's okay to not constantly be churning out content and you can just like chill and not be creative for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Rest. I feel that. I feel, you know, my creative spark really died. I was like, I'm going to write my second book at the beginning of the the podcast. Yeah. And then I didn't. Same. It was like, I, I, all my creative juices stopped. And then I saw this meme like earlier on in the pandemic and it was like, Hey, just in case no one told you, you don't need to write the next best screenplay. You don't have to have a novel finished. You don't have to do shit. We're in a pandemic. I was like, Oh great. Thank you. I needed that. Thank you. Uh, my mental health needs some rest yeah. right now. Cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love that answer. Okay. Something that you are really grateful for right now. Uh, my mom mm. and just family in general you know, like definitely the more I look at my family and how my mom and I have always been, the more I'm like thankful. Cause I know some people don't have that. And I can't imagine going through my life and the stuff that's gone, been thrown my way without that. Are we going to see your mom pop up more in the second book? Yes. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I was like, I feel like you got a, like a sneak peek of y'all's relationship, yeah. but I'm excited that there's going to be more of that. Yeah. It's like really, really sweet. And so. I love that. Okay, yeah, favorite great. swear word. Fuck. Yeah, me too. No problem. Really, I knew that that was going to be your answer. Come on. 
<laughs> I don't know. Maybe it could have been like asshole. I don't know. All right. You never know. Like, you never know. That's my word. <laughs> okay. And last question. What does it mean to you to live your fuck yes life? Um, I think it means, well, for me, at least specifically, to just show up authentically. So it's like, if you feel like shit, show up and be like, look, I feel like shit. Um, if you're feeling amazing, then it's okay to be like, I'm feeling fucking amazing and I deserve to buy myself X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, and really just letting yourself do the things that you love and not feeling bad about it and not feeling like you have to conform to any certain type of box in this life because there's so many different avenues to take and you can take multiple ones if you want. Mm, I love that. That is a that is something that I always say is like fuck the boxes. Like, yeah. Break them down and just I want to be a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> of all the shapes. The triangle right. must right. That probably that's a little triggering for me. I was in too many triads when I first Okay, okay, sure. I, like, I don't know about the triangle dynamic. I'm like I'm going to go with a hexagon. Oh my god. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> the triangle funny. shape, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. And where can our listeners connect with you, get in your sphere, all of that good stuff? Yes. Yeah, so I am on Instagram at Gabrielle Stone and TikTok is at underscore or sorry, at Gabrielle underscore stone. Um, you'd think I would know the TikTok name by now. It's still a challenge for me. Um, and the website is eatprayfml.com. You can get all of our merch and um, signed copies there. And then the book itself is on Amazon in paperback, ebook, audiobook, and they just released hardcover, which is like super exciting. I saw that. How did you get, how did you manage to do that? So that's the one thing that self-publishing has always, well, you know, um, has not had is yeah. hardcover. That's yeah. the one thing that, that publishing companies has always kind of held over us. And KDP on Amazon did like a beta test with authors that were pulling in, you know, certain numbers. And I was luckily one of them and we can't get author copies yet, which is kind of Bummer. shitty. Um, but we officially can sell hardcover copies of the book, which is awesome. That's really cool. Hopefully yeah. that'll be like more of a staple and like a I think they're or, like doing a beta test so they can like widely roll it out because it's yeah. like why wouldn't you at this point you know yeah I don't know there's something about a hard copy that you just makes you yeah like, read it more I don't fancy know <laughs> it feels it feels fancier for sure yeah I love that thank you so much for just you know being you being your authentic self I feel like it's really rare to have human beings that speak so candidly about stuff that's so hard and I mean, that's why I immediately felt connected to you because I was like, this is the shit that I feel is important. This is how I want to show up on a day-to-day -day basis. And honestly, I'm really particular with who I bring on my podcast for that reason. Like, I don't want to bring anyone else on that's not authentic, that's yeah. not, you know, raw and and willing to just like give it to you straight. And And I love what you said about living your fuck yes life for you is about showing up exactly where you're at. And I think something that we forget as human beings is that it's okay to be like, I'm in a shit mood right now. And yeah. especially as like entrepreneurs, it can be really hard to not feel like you have to be on all the time. It's also like totally. your mentality. It's like, okay, camera goes on and I have to like have my shit together. Yeah. And I think something that's been really cool about the progress of even having this podcast for me is it's like, I remember starting being like, I have to be so on. And now I'm like, yeah. Okay. Like whatever. Sometimes I show up like this. Other times I show up with a top knot and like, look yep. like I just roll out of bed and like all Damn. of it, is, <laughs> all of it is you and all of it is, is beautiful. And I think I really love that. And I think you embody that. And so thank you for being oh. you and for being here and sharing your heart and your story and all that goodness. Thanks girl. Thank you so much for having me on it. I do a lot of interviews and a decent amount of podcasts and this has been really great. You have a wonderful energy and I, I need to pick up your book and uh, stay connected with you for sure. Oh yeah. We're official friends now. So yes. you won't be able to get rid of me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs>